Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we hear your word again today, that by your spirit you would continue to keep us standing on that firm foundation who is Jesus, and that you empower us to put his words into practice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Dear friends of Jesus, our Savior, well, today we continue our sermon series built on the rock based on Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to start by reading verses 24 and 25. Jesus says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and put them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. So what we read is that those who hear the words of Jesus and put them into practice is like the wise men. And then we read about the fool. In verse 26, it says, But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. See, the difference between the wise man who built a house that stood... And the fool who built a house that came crashing down is the nature of the foundation. See, so if anyone hears the words of Jesus and does not put them into practice, it's like they're building their life on sand that will never withstand all the pressures and difficulties and challenges that we face in this life. And it also won't stand up under judgment day. But a person who hears the words of Jesus and puts them into practice is like building on this firm foundation who is Jesus, a rock-solid foundation that will withstand all the things that we face in this life, good and bad, and into eternity. And that means as Christ followers, as we are, have our lives built on this solid foundation, we will stand on judgment day. You see, what Jesus is telling us is this. For those who hear the words of Jesus and don't put them in practice, those are people who don't believe. They don't believe in Jesus. They don't believe his words, and that's why they can't put his words into practice. But for those who hear the words of Jesus and put them into practice, the reason they can put them into practice is because they believe. They believe Jesus. They believe his words, and then the power of the Holy Spirit moves through them and in them to put into practice the words of Jesus. And again, that's why it's so important for us to build on that solid foundation by being in God's word on a daily basis so that we build on the solid foundation who is Jesus. Now notice that Jesus says that the winds and the rains and the streams, he doesn't say when they might come, he says, no, they came for both the fool and the wise person. And that means that we're all going to face trials and difficulties and challenges in this life. It just happens or it already has happened. And again, that's why it's so important to build our life on that strong foundation. See, this foundation is not only important for our lives, it's also important for the church because you are the church, I am the church, we are the church together. The church is not a building. The church is made up of people. God says that you are like a living stone being built into a spiritual house called the church. 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 says, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Again, God's word says that when we come into a relationship with Jesus, we become part of another community called the church. And that means the foundation for our life is the same foundation for the church. And that's why through this sermon series, I've been talking about core values for Christ Lutheran Church and Yuma Lutheran School. Because the core value is something that doesn't change. It's something that we stand on, something that's firm, just like God's word. 
Because we're going to be tempted to change with the changing culture. The culture wants us to change what we believe and change what we teach to fit their way of living. And a core value is something that we should, uh, that we should value so much that we're willing to forsake everything else so that we can live out our core value. It's really just a way of saying who and what we believe. Well, today, the core value I'm talking about is leadership is vital to raise up the next generation. And the reason that this is so important is because we want to pass on everything we have learned and everything we believe to the next generation, especially when it comes to our faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because we don't pass on our faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, then the next generation then may not believe. And then not only will they not have eternal life if they don't believe, then they also aren't going to put the words of Jesus into practice. People have said a lot of young people have left the church. You may have heard people say, I went into a church and I'm wondering, where are all the young people? And so I have to ask this question have the, people, have the young people left the building or have they left the church? See the difference? Because one says they have left the local congregation. If they're not in the local congregation, it means that they've left the local congregation. Maybe they went to a different congregation. Maybe they're not attending church at all, but they still believe. The second one says they don't believe anymore. They've left the church, being part of the church. They have renounced their faith in Jesus Christ. And while I know that has happened in some people's lives, I truly believe with all of my heart that for most people who have been brought up in the faith, they haven't left the church. They haven't renounced their faith. They've left the congregation. And one of the reasons they've left the congregation is because we haven't always done a great job of raising up the next generation. We haven't always done a great job of discipling them and then raising them up for service to our Lord and other people. Because I do believe that young people do want to serve and they do want to make a difference because sometimes people say they don't want to, but they do. They do want to serve. They do want to make a difference. But again, the reason that many people have left is because, again, we haven't always done a great job discipling them, and then we haven't then used them and equipped them to use their gifts and abilities and their talents and their passions to serve our Lord and others. Now, in the Bible, we read about a number of people whom God has called, and then he raises up and up in leadership roles. One such person was a man by the name of Joshua. Joshua was Moses' aide since youth, from his youth. Did you know that? From his youth, he was the aide of Moses. We also read that he then grew up and he became commander of the army. Joshua also went up with Moses on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. I just read that. I've read that before, but it just st stood out to me that he was with Moses, or at least started his way up the mountain with Moses to receive the Ten Commandments. We know that because he's there going with him, and then he, he's coming down, and the first person who speaks is Joshua. Joshua, then, is also with Moses at the Tent of Meeting. The Tent of Meeting is a tent that Moses set up outside the camp. And then the glory of the Lord would come down in the cloud. The pillar of cloud would come down at the tent of meeting and the Lord would speak to Moses. And when Moses went back to the people to share what God had said to him, Joshua stayed at the tent, which means he was there. He was there and invited into these very intimate, intimate moments with Moses and God and I'm, I'm sure he overheard God speak to Moses, preparing him for this leadership role. We also read that God commands uh, Moses to lay his hands on him for a special blessing. In Numbers chapter 27, beginning with verse 18, it says, So the Lord said to Moses, 
Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom, there, whom is the Spirit, and lay your hands on him. Have him stand before Eleazar the priest and the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. He is to stand before Eleazar the priest who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Ur Urim and Urim before the Lord. At his command, he and the entire community of Israelites will go out and at his command, they will come in. So the Lord gave Joshua this authority to establish Joshua as the successor of Moses before Moses died in front of the people so that when Moses died, he would be ready to lead the people and the people would be ready to follow. You see, there was no vacancy. There was no intentional interim needed until they chose the next leader. There is Joshua, a man full of the Spirit, chosen by God from youth, ready to serve God's people. Now, this wasn't going to be an easy mission. It's going to be very difficult. So Joshua had to remember the words of God who said to him, I will always be with you. He had to trust God, and that's why I believe God said over and over again, because the mission was going to be difficult, be strong and courageous. Look it up. How many times God says to Joshua, be strong and courageous, for I am with you. Joshua not only had to speak the book of the law, which was God's word, but he also had to meditate on God's word day and night so that he would do what the Lord commanded. Sound a lot like Matthew chapter 5? It's almost identical. He was to meditate on the word of God day and night so that he could do what the Lord commanded him to do. And if he did that, he would be successful. He would be prosperous. So why was this mission so important? It was so important because Joshua wasn't just leading God's people into the promised land. He was also raising that generation and the next generation and the next generation to have eyes of faith, just like he was uh, raised up as a leader by Moses, to have eyes of faith to look for another Joshua. The word Joshua means the Lord saves. Another Joshua who's going to come down for the purpose of saving the world to raise up the next generation so that they would have eyes of faith to look for the Messiah, the Savior, who we know as Jesus, who came down to this earth to save people from their sins through his life, death, and resurrection. To help raise up the next generation to have eyes of faith so that they can see Jesus, the Savior, who's going to come back so that anyone who believes, when he comes, he's going to take all those who believe, past, present, and future, into the promised land of heaven. You see, raising up the next generation is all about Jesus, because Jesus is the only one who saves. So how can we raise up the next generation? How can we raise up the next generation the way God wants us to do so? Well, I can tell you what happened in our home. Now, when I say these things, what our mom and dad, what our mom and dad did, I, I can tell you that I wasn't as faithful to the things that they did as they did for us. So I'm just being honest with you in that. But I can tell you it all started in the home. I can tell you that we read God's word every single day, Monday through Saturday. And then we use a devotion called Little Visits with God. Right, Tony? <laughs> Little Visits with God. We would read that book over and over again until that book was falling apart. Up to a certain age, our parents would make sure we read that. And we took turns reading the scriptures. We took turns reading from the book, as my dad called it, until that book fell apart. And then I think there was Little Visits with God, too. I don't know if we actually used that or that was another edition. But anyway, there was Little Visits with God as well, but we did that every single night. And then we prayed together. We'd go around the table and we'd have each one of us would have opportunity to pray. And then on Sunday mornings we went to church and Sunday school, no exceptions. It's just the way it was. You had to have a fever or you had to show other signs of sickness to miss 
church and Sunday school. And then they made sure we were in a Lutheran school. Now, of course, my dad was the principal. Of course, we went to a Lutheran school. But no, they wanted us to be in a Lutheran school. But you see, just as important as those things, and those things were really important because that's the foundation they were building our lives upon, helping us build our lives upon, is that we then witness what our parents did. We witnessed our parents praying. We witnessed our parents reading God's word on their own. We witnessed them joyfully serving the Lord in so many different ways. And then when we, grew, when we were older, they then made sure we had opportunities to serve as well. Whether it be opportunities to serve in the church or opportunities to serve in our community. Now, fast forward to 1995. 1995, I was called to be assistant pastor of Christ Lutheran Church under the, my friend and mentor, Pastor Roger Shalm, who I worked with for a number of years. Pastor Johnson is associate pastor. I was assistant pastor. And Pastor Shalm made sure I knew that because the way I identify, the way I interpret that word is gopher pastor. So I was gopher pastor the first year with other duties as assigned. And so in his wisdom, this is what he had me do. He, he knew that I w he was going to eventually retire, and so he had me the first year preach every three weeks. And then he gave me other duties as assigned. The second year, he had me preach every other week, and then he gave me more responsibilities and more duties. The third year, he says, it's all yours, I'm done, I'm retiring. And he did. Now, he didn't leave town like he said he was going to. He stayed here, and I was so thankful he did that because he was just a street away, literally a street away where I could go over and I could talk to him at any time for wisdom and for advice when things were really difficult and tough here at Christ Lutheran Church and New Lutheran School, and he would be there to encourage me. It was like God saying to Joshua, be strong and courageous. God used Pastor Shalom to speak into my life, be strong and courageous and do not give up. And then in between growing up and Christ Lutheran Church and Yuma Lutheran School, God placed so many other mentors in my life that prepared me for leadership and prepared me to serve in this place. So again, how do we raise up the next generation? It all starts in the home. And so if you are the head of the house, whoever it is, what, whoever the head of the house, it has to begin with that person. Now, I said before, unfortunately, there are families that have given this responsibility over to the church. They want the church to do this for them through Yuma School or through Worship Kids Style or through... Uh, through uh, summer camp or, or through youth ministry activities. But see, we're here to help, but we don't have the influence that you as parents and grandparents have on your children. And so whoever the head of the house is, they have to take the responsibility for this to begin in the home. And if you as a dad or a father aren't the head of the house, let me encourage you to take back that responsibility that God has given you to lead, to begin with by praying and by reading the scriptures, just as Joshua was told by God to read and meditate on them day and night, and then to serve. I read statistics that it says that more women are, that women are more spiritual than men. And that's unfortunately because we should be equally spiritual, right? We should all be in the Word of God. We should all be in prayer. And so it's important that all of us, that we're spiritual and that we are in the Word of God and in prayer. Because then as we then raise up our children, as we raise up our families, they then will be on that rock-solid foundation. And then we can serve. Because when you do those things, the things that I just mentioned, your kids and grandchildren are watching, and then maybe they're more likely to do those things. But most importantly is to teach God's Word, to read God's Word to your children and grandchildren. So they're built on this, again, this solid foundation. And so then they can then ultimately serve with you and others in the church and in our community. 
You see, when that groundwork has begun, then we as a church can come and help continue to build up leaders, not only in the home, but also in the church. If you are serving already, let me encourage you to bring your children and grandchildren along to help just let them watch you serve. Let them see what you're doing. You don't have to, they don't have to do anything. They can just watch and see what you're doing. Learn from you. If you are serving already, you know somebody who would do well in that leadership, in that serving role as an adult, invite them to just come and watch, come and see. See what you're doing. Then afterwards, have coffee with them, have lunch with them, and talk about what they saw, talk about what you did. Maybe God is going to use you as a mentor, just as Pastor Sean was a mentor to me, where you invite someone to come and watch you then give them a little more, you give them a little, you give them something to do, you give them a little more responsibility and a little bit more and a little bit more until they are serving on their own. You see, this model can work in any serve opportunity. In fact, it needs to work in every serve opportunity so that we continue to raise up the next generation. Because if we teach the next generation God's word, and then prayerfully and intentionally model and mentor them for service to our Lord and others, we are doing what the Lord Jesus has, tell, has told us to do. We will raise up the next generation for people to be on that solid foundation who is Jesus, who then will serve our Lord and others. To God be the glory. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you have given us many examples of people that you have raised up to be leaders in your church. And Lord, we pray that you would forgive us for the times that we haven't been faithful as we should, either in our own homes or in our church, to raise up the next generation. Lord, we pray for your spirit to empower us to continue to teach in our homes and in our church the good news of Jesus so that our children and their children will know you and have life in your name. And we pray that we would then use their gifts and abilities to serve you and others in your church and in our community. Lord, help us to raise up the next generation for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.